AI taking center stage last week at the World Economic Forum in Davos, alongside discussions of global conflicts, including the Russia-Ukraine war and the israel Hamas war. Join us right now to discuss the intersection of geopolitics and technology. Joe Lonsdale is here, founding partner of 8VC, uh, which is a uh, back defense tech companies like Andril and uh, Epirus. He's also co-founder, of course, of Palantir and co-founder of a self-described free speech university in Austin, which I want to talk to you about. But I want to ask you, I want to start with just an AI question. Mm -hmm. Everybody was going, you know, AI crazy in Davos. And the thing that I can't figure out is whether AI is going to be so pervasive that it becomes sort of a commoditized feature of basically every piece of software that everybody has, or whether it's actually going to be a, going to ultimately create new standalone products that create new value. Meaning, you look at some of these, if it's, if it's just going to be a feature of everything, then the question is how much more value is it creating in, these, in, in the companies that either already exist or the new companies. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, well, you know, AI, Andrew, is going to be something that impacts productivity. That's what really matters here, right? At the end of the day, what are we all doing with these markets, with these businesses? You want to create more with less. You want right. to create more prosperity for society. When you have something like electricity, I mean, it takes decades to work its way through everything, right? Electricity, I think 30 years in, you finally had factories designed to use electricity. But, but even, the, even in the first decade, it did a lot of other things. Right. AI right now, it's going after a lot of areas. We're seeing already how it could raise the margins, how it could address things. There's lots of service areas of the economy. I'll give you one example. Healthcare billing is a 280 billion revenue area, 280 billion revenue area. And we're already seeing how AI is probably going to be able to double the margins in that area, which basically means you pull $100 billion of spend out of the economy. That's, that's new wealth it creates right. through productivity. There's, there's probably going to be trillions of dollars of that the next five years. You think in the next five years that that happens? I think you actually see by the mid to late 2020s, like economic numbers showing up where productivity has gone up. Do you think, though, you know, you look, I was thinking Con Ed, which is electricity in New York, it's not, been a, it's not, not a great high flyer of a, a stock because at some point it does become commoditized. So is, it, is there like a period right now which is like a renaissance and then it, it, it gets commoditized? The other thing that I worry about or think about is whether we're in 1996 or 1999, where there's just going to be too much of an over, almost overinvestment in, in this area, and there's going to be a complete, a lot of collateral damage when it's over. I mean, the way markets work with new possibilities is there always is overinvestment. There's a few big platforms that emerge that are going to be extraordinarily valuable. The same way in the late 90s, you have things like Amazon born, you have Google born. Obviously, those would have been really good bets. You have a lot of other things that there's too much hype. But then basically, you have these infrastructure for AI that makes a lot of money because two or three or five things emerge as winners there. Right. And then the whole economy benefits. If productivity goes up, as much as it looks like it's going to do, that makes money for every one of us. And that's a good thing for the whole society. Do you think there's more value in the software piece or the hardware piece? One of the things that I think has been fascinating to hear, people were talking about it actually in Davos, is Sam Altman, who was there from OpenAI, clearly has been looking around to try to raise money to actually start manufacturing chips. In the, in the old world, chips were never considered a valuable thing to do. And by the way, maybe in 10 years from now, there'll be an overabundance of chips and nobody will care about chips anymore. But for the next five or 10 years, it seems like you know, you, people won't be able to get enough of them. There, the infrastructure of chips is critical to make this work. If you can make a com chips commoditized, that means the rest of us are going to be all very well off because you're going to be applying it to the whole economy. I mean, the most money is going to be made, frankly, for the S&P 500, for the big companies that are more productive overall. That's where the real money gets made if this works. But we need the chips to do that. I mean, Sam's thinking, how can I apply this technology? How do we scale it? There's a scarcity of, of, of chips. So it's really smart to do. In the defense world, how do you think it fundamentally changes things? I mean, we were talking to your yeah. uh, co-founder, uh, Alex Karp, about sort of how AI is going to impact his business. He's leveraging ChatGPT and some of these other uh, large language models as well. So the question is, do you have to create your own model? Is it really just about taking somebody else's model and applying it to what you're doing? Well, it was really cool. I guess OpenAI opened up to defense now. But listen, in the defense world, software is becoming more important. AI makes software determinative in defense. We already have all these new companies needed in defense because the old big primes, the big legacy defense contractors, they're really good at hardware. They're pretty bad at software. Thanks to AI, you now desperately need all the new companies in defense because there's a bigger gap there. What, is, what does that mean, determinant? Like determine it means like, it means after, or you mean determining what, what lines you kind of follow? It means determining like what technologies are dominant in warfare, right? So if you, if you have AI being as good as it is now, suddenly uh, it really, really matters to have the best software. If you're going to be doing, like, you, you want to get a certain amount of money for a certain amount of outcome, right? So if you're going to be building a thousand small autonomous drones for some kind of battle scenario, if you have AI, you desperately are going to need the best software companies involved in that. Otherwise, you're going to lose that battle. You're going to, you're going to not be deploying it correctly. Hey, I know that, I think you think Bitcoin is real, right? Um, my question now is, it, 
you know, it's become mainstream to the point of ETFs. I think it's would be harder to go higher quickly now. Unlike, uh, it was supposed to be that everyone can get in now and that all the ETF companies are gonna need to buy Bitcoin to put it in the ETFs. To me, it's like, if you bought it at $800 or $8,000, you were smart, you went through a lot of trouble to buy it. Now everyone can buy it, I think it's gonna be here for a while. There's not gonna be a whole new financial story driving it from the, from, the, from the side of buyers necessarily, although there's one type of buyer that could be very important here. AI agents are gonna start doing a lot of things in our economy, and for AI agents to coordinate with incentive crypto. systems, yeah. they're right. probably gonna use crypto. And so if this AI story works out in certain consumer areas, so, especially, and then tokenize so everything. To, to AI, yeah. yeah. Do, yeah. Do you, you know, Kathy Wood, 500,000, a million, and that's year, is I, that a year. I can't believe any. Yeah, for for. But, for is, that, but is it? But they're not going to be track trading Bitcoin. They might be using Ethereum. They might be using Solana. They right. might be using other t other things right. that they can Those are the three. Those are the three they might use, and they're probably all correlated at the end of the day. And you know, I mean, the five hundred thousand story for me, Joe, is more about is more about the macro question. Are we going to be in a massive deficit in twenty five and twenty six and spending money willy nilly irresponsibly? If so, what asset's safe? I mean, if you have inflation come up again, you have bonds sell off again with, 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 with the crazy government spending, well, that's a story I've been hearing a lot from a lot of my friends who know macro better than me. You could see crypto do very well. Yeah, we're not going from 100% debt to GDP back down to 30 just by waving a magic right. wand, are okay. we? How are we going to do that? Well, it's I got mean, to you, you got to fire a lot of people. But that's a whole <laughs> other question. Um,